you're a therapist, chances are you have student loans and a lot of them. I know this debt can feel overwhelming, but it doesn't need to run, much less ruin your life. You have good options. It's just that navigating the student loan system is really, really difficult. But never fear. That is why today we're going to cover the top 10 tips for managing student loan debt. I want every therapist to know. Hi team, my name is Dave. I'm a financial planner and the founder of Turning Point Financial Life Planning, where I use the tools of financial planning to help therapists grow their impact and build lives they love. If you're new, please go ahead and click on that subscribe button. Today, we're gonna to talk about how to manage your federal student loan debt. So if you have loans through the private marketplace, these pointers won't apply to you, but don't worry, I'll cover private student loans in a post in the near future. Before we jump in, just a quick reminder that nothing I'll cover here today is advice for you to implement. Rather, it is an education to help you decide what's the best move for you. If you suspect you need professional advice to navigate the particulars of your situation, please seek professional advice out. I, for one, would be happy to have a complimentary conversation with you. All right, so without further ado, let's jump into the 10 things I want every therapist to know about their federal student loan debt. Number one, make space for hard to hold emotions. Money oftentimes is emotional. That's especially true when we're dealing with something as big and potentially as heavy as six-figure student loan debt. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to make space and time to hold those emotions and allow those challenging emotions to come up. So before we go any further today, what I'd like to do is just take a moment to take a little bit of a cleansing breath. So let's take a, a big breath in, we'll hold it for a moment, and then slowly release the breath. All right, I hope you feel a little bit better, perhaps a little bit more centered. I think I do. Let's move on to tip number two. Make space for hope. As a therapist, having $100,000 in student loans and sometimes much more isn't the exception, it's pretty much the rule. So relax, you're in good company and rest assured there is no student loan balance too big to be effectively managed. You will not be saddled with this debt for the rest of your life. And as I said before, it need not run, much less ruin your life. Regardless of whether you work in a mental health agency or in your own private practice, there are good options out there for you. Three, know your student loan debt to income ratio. I know we're gonna do a little bit of math here, but bear with me and don't worry, I'll walk you through it step by step. Knowing this ratio is really important because it will help you decide which of the two paths to debt payoff or debt forgiveness you'll likely want to pursue. So the first step is to determine what your annual income is. If you're single, the easiest place to look is on your most recently filed tax return. So get that document and look for the adjusted gross income or AGI number. If you're married and live in a community property state, and the list of those states I have below in the show notes, in that case, you'll also want to look for that adjusted gross income number, but in that case, you'll want to divide by two. Finally, if you're married but live in a non-community property state, and that is most states, in that case, you don't wanna look at your tax return. Rather, you wanna figure out how much money do you make as an individual. So look at the W-2 your employer sent you for last year, or if you have your own private practice, look at last year's pre-tax earnings or your earnings before tax number to determine how much you make as an individual. Next, you'll wanna determine what your total outstanding student loan balance is. You can do that by looking at a recent statement from your loan servicer or logging into your online account. Once you have that total outstanding number, divide it by the annual income number that we calculated in step one. If that resulting number is 1.2 or greater, you're likely a very strong candidate for an income-driven repayment plan, and you'll likely have some amount of your student loan balances forgiven at the end of that payment plan. 
if the number is 1.0 or below, chances are you're not a very good candidate for an income-driven repayment plan. You likely wouldn't benefit very much from that plan. And your best approach is likely gonna to be to pay the loans off as rapidly as you can to minimize any interest charges. Refinancing with a private lender might be one way to reduce your interest rate and reduce that interest expense. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And finally, if your number is between 1 and 1.2, you're in between. In that case, I would think about what's likely to happen to your earnings over time. If your earnings are likely to be reasonably flat or maybe even decline due to a change in life, then income driven might still be a good option for you. On the other hand, if you think your income is likely to increase and increase substantially, then chances are income driven payment plans won't offer you too much of a benefit. What is an income driven repayment plan? Well, there are several, but they all operate in essentially the same way. And that is that they look exclusively at your annual income to determine what your monthly payment will be. And when that debt to income ratio is 1.2 or higher, these income driven repayment plans can reduce your monthly payment often by a really large margin. I will go into all the detail around these IDR plans as they're called in a future post. So be sure and subscribe so you don't miss that one. I'll include in that post a link to a spreadsheet that will help you calculate how much an IDR plan could potentially save you on a monthly basis. Four, assume your loan servicer is wrong. I don't care which loan servicer you have, chances are you've gotten some inaccurate information or just outright bad or ill-informed advice from them. The folks you talk to in the call centers of the loan servicers simply have not been given adequate support, resources, training, or analytical tools to really provide you good advice. When they make mistakes about factual items like what repayment plan you're on, and they do make those kinds of mistakes, there is no way I would trust them to advise you about using deferment or forbearance or income-driven repayment plans. I would get everything in writing, look at your statements, and if you need professional guidance, seek out a professional who is a fiduciary and who has specialized student loan training. I happen to be one of those professionals and I'd be happy to have a complimentary conversation with you. And there are many other qualified professionals out there. I will include a link below to a directory. Approach loan consolidation with caution. If you're contemplating consolidating your outstanding loans within the federal system, really think that through. Oftentimes there's no clear benefit to doing so while consolidation does have some clear downsides. Those downsides include that your interest rate will increase, albeit just slightly. Secondly, any progress, any qualifying payments you've made towards public service loan forgiveness will be wiped out and you'll have to start over. Third, if you have any, any outstanding unpaid interest, that unpaid interest will capitalize and that capitalization will increase future interest charges. Also, if you have any loans like Perkins loans that have some borrower friendly benefits, those benefits in most cases get eliminated in the consolidation process. And finally, you will lose the ability to target payments towards the highest interest rate debt. Once you consolidate, all of your student debt has the exact same interest rate. With all these downsides, you might be wondering, is it ever a smart time to consolidate? The answer is yes, you'll want to carefully explore the nuances of your particular circumstances, but there are three times when it can make very good sense to consolidate. First, if you've become delinquent or even in default, the consolidation process can bring your account current. However, you can only do that once, so be sure and time that consolidation when you need it. The second time it might make sense to consolidate is to expand the access you have to different income driven repayment plans. I'll go through all the details of that process and how consolidation fits into that process in my forthcoming post on income driven repayment plans. So again, be sure and subscribe so you don't miss that. The third time it can make sense to consolidate is if you have an older FELL loan and you're missing out on benefits that you really need. As an example, not all FELL loans are eligible for the coronavirus administrative forbearance benefits of no interest accrual and no required payments. But any outstanding FELL loan, even a single loan, can be consolidated and thereby turned into a direct loan where you will get all the benefits that everyone else does. So that can make sense as well. 
the too long didn't read for this bullet point really is if you are consolidating your loan just for the administrative ease of having a single loan rather than several, I would really encourage you to hold off. Six, beware private loan consolidation companies. Sadly, if not predictably, there are many, many scams that target student loan borrowers. The most benign of these scams will simply egregiously overcharge you for something you could have done yourself. The more malignant of them will steal your identity and cause long-term financial damage. So be cautious out there. If people are aggressively soliciting you, if they're suggesting you need to act now before it's too late, ignore them, they are lying. If something sounds fishy or too good to be true, guess what it probably is. Trust your instincts, be super cautious, never give out your FSA account credentials, and always work with professionals who you can independently verify and only work with reputable and well-known financial institutions. Seven, approach private refinancing with caution. If that debt to income ratio we calculated for you is below one, the best approach for you is likely to pay off your student loans as quickly as possible to minimize the interest charges that you will ultimately incur. One way to further reduce your interest expenses are to refinance through the private market or through private lenders. With interest rates as low as they are right now, especially if you have a good credit score, you can save a ton of money by significantly reducing your interest rate. However, in exchange for that lower interest rate, you will be giving up forever all of the favorable provisions that are available to you and borrower protections available to you within the federal student loan system. Those include public service loan forgiveness, other forms of long-term forgiveness, any new forgiveness that Biden issues through executive order or Congress passes, as well as favorable death and discharge provisions, all those disappear forever the moment you refinance with a private lender. So just be really clear on what you're giving away and that you're comfortable doing that. And also be sure and fully understand all the provisions of that private loan before you sign on the dotted line. Eight, if you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness, triple check everything. Private Service Loan Forgiveness, or PSLF for short, is like the holy grail of student loans. Everyone is talking about it, everyone is looking for it, and yet no one seems to be able to find it. Perhaps it's not real and it doesn't exist. I can assure you, PSLF is real. There are borrowers who are having their loan balances forgiven as a result of this program. And it is a very fussy program. There are many, many details that you have to get spot on right. Otherwise, you will be disqualified. I know that's a bummer, which is why I will dedicate an entire post exclusively to PSLF in the very near future. But for right now, let's just cover the three essential things you need to do in order to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. First, you need to have the right kind of loan. You need to have a direct federal loan. Make sure that direct is in the name of the loan. If you have an older loan from before 2010, that is almost certainly a FEL loan. They do not qualify. You will need to convert that loan to a direct loan through the consolidation process. Number two, you need to be making eligible payments. Public service loan forgiveness requires that 120 qualifying monthly payments be made. So that's 10 years of payments and you need to be in the right type of payment plan or repayment plan for those payments to count. If you look at the details on a statement, do not trust anything the loan servicer tells you over the phone, look at a statement and if there's the word graduated or extended in your repayment plan terminology, you're in the wrong kind of plan. Now there are some limited exceptions to get around the wrong type of repayment plan, but ideally you will want to be in one of the income driven repayment plans to maximize the amount of forgiveness that you will get under PSLF. Number three, you need to be working of course in the right type of job. You need to be working either for the government or for a nonprofit. Generally that nonprofit needs to be a 501c3 and you need to be working there full time for pay. Volunteering does not count. Finally, you need to hold that job, be earning money from that job at three different points. First, when you make every single one of those 120 in payments. Second, when you 
apply for forgiveness, and third, when that forgiveness is ultimately granted. A lot to keep in mind here, which is why be sure and stay tuned for the PSLF post if that's something you're pursuing. Number nine, prepare for the tax bomb of longer term forgiveness. All right, so what am I even talking about here? PSLF, public service loan forgiveness, that is tax free forgiveness. However, there is forgiveness offered after 20 or 25 years under all of the different income driven repayment plans. If you ultimately benefit from any of this longer term forgiveness, there will be a tax bomb. What that means is the amount of debt forgiven will be taxable income to you and that can create a nasty tax surprise if you're not prepared for it. 20 and 25 years is a long time in the future, so you can save just a very small amount every month, set it aside, and you will have more than enough money to cover the tax bomb if and when it comes to pass. Now, it is probable, although far from guaranteed, that there will be legislation which will make this longer term loan forgiveness a not taxed benefit. However, legislation is chaotic. It's unpredictable. I would not count on that until a bill becomes law. Finally, number 10, use deferment and forbearance with care. Both deferment and forbearance can be decent tools to bring current a delinquent account. However, if you're looking to stop payments for a short period of time, entering into an income-driven repayment plan can oftentimes be a better tool to use. Under these plans, your monthly payment can be as low as $0, and there's an added benefit here. That added benefit is that entering into an IDR plan will minimize any capitalization of unpaid interest. And that capitalization will increase your interest expense down the road. So be sure and critically evaluate when entering into an income-driven repayment plan might be a better option for you. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today. I think these 10 pointers will really give you a good foundation to begin thinking about how you want to navigate your student loans. And yet there is a lot more ground we should cover, especially if you're thinking about income-driven repayment plans or public service loan forgiveness. So be sure and watch for those upcoming posts. And as always, never hesitate to reach out if I can answer a question or be helpful to you in any other way. I'm always happy to chat over email and equally happy to hold a complimentary 30 minute conversation where we will simply have a relaxed conversation about whatever is going on in your financial life, including student loans. Thanks so much for watching today and have a great rest of your day.